Hi, welcome to another Behind the Shot Image Critique. Hi, as always, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is one of the most fun days I have of any given month. It is the Image Critique Day. If you're not familiar with the uh, podcast, let me give you a couple of quick tips, and that is, first of all, the podcast itself, the normal episodes, they are available wherever you get your podcasts. Whatever your podcatcher app or service is, if you search for Behind the Shot, you'll find two possible feeds, the audio-only feed and the video feed. If your podcast catcher app does not support video, that's okay. We've always got the video here on YouTube as well. And if you are watching on YouTube, please, right now, those of you that are in the chat, head down, hit the like button, hit subscribe. It really does help with the, the algorithms. For that matter, if you are watching the podcast, the normal podcast, in a podcast app, leave, whether it be Apple, Google, whatever, leave a star rating, leave a written review. It really does help, and, and it would be much appreciated. Also, we've got something new. Uh, my guests are now coming in in 1080 full HD. So I want to thank my friends over at DVE Store. HD Video is being sponsored by them. It's dvestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. And to Guy and the crew over there, thank you very, very much. One other thing I want to mention to you is the Wanderers Photo Workshop. That's the New Orleans workshop I'm doing with Ant and, and Freddie and Andrew. It was going to be next month, but based on everything that's happened in New Orleans, we've actually moved that to January. Uh, it's going to be the 23rd through the 27th of January. This is a multi-day, multi-genre workshop. I'm doing music. Uh, Ant is doing street, and then we've got Andrew and Freddie doing food. It's pretty much an all-inclusive workshop, a couple of exceptions. But again, head on over to the workshop at uh, wanderersphoto.com. You can get all the details you need there. As always for these shows, I have a couple of co-hosts. And as usual, Don Komarechka is here. Don, how are you? <laughs> I am very well. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you as always, my friend. And rejoining the band, the one and only <laughs> Mr. Andrew Anatko. Andy, how are you? Mm -hmm. Hanging in, hanging on. I hope you guys are doing the same. Uh, we are. We are doing great. And it's always good to have you back. You have been on this show, uh, the critique shows, more than anybody else because the, the comments when you're on this show, both from you on the photos, but the comments during and after, people love you on this show. So I appreciate you're doing this every time you oh, do. Good. Uh, I hope, hope I, I'm serving king and country. Yes, king. And for those that don't know Andy, uh, Andy is a phenomenal photographer, but his actual quote-unquote day job, he is a tech journalist. You're with WGBH in Boston. When are you on on WGBH? I'm almost every Friday, uh, usually around 1 o'clock, uh, rounding up the tech news of the week for about uh, 20 minutes to half an hour, depending on uh, if a local, local a politician needs some time to to apologize for something i get less but usually we have time to get also, into it you do num a number of different podcasts so tell people the podcasts that you do and where they can get them uh primarily i do a weekly uh apple podcast and a weekly google podcast so i do uh mac break weekly for the this week in tech network and a google podcast for the uh, for uh, relay.fm it's material with myself and florence ion Okay, and then if you want to follow him, since we do this through the Flickr group, if you guys want to follow Andy on Flickr, it's Andy I on Flickr, and he is a longtime avid Flickr user. I still <laughs> think it's the best way to view pictures. It's a, I I, th I think it's actually my oldest social uh, my, my oldest social media account by far, and the fact that the fact that I'm Andy I it should show you how early I got on board. I think now that I think about mine was originally Raz Two, and I've changed it to my name now, but. Uh, I think it was mine too, and and all the early photo walks, the first ever photo walks I ever, ever did was because of Flickr. Don, where can people find you? Tell everybody about your podcast and your book and everything else. Well, and you can also find me on Flickr too. It's a, it's a great platform, and anytime when I post a new image anywhere online, you'll also get it on Flickr. And uh, Flickr has such a wonderful, I guess, reputation for catering to photographers. So I just want to give a thumbs up there too. But my podcast, Photo Geek Weekly, uh, which, by the way, we are recording an episode of immediately after this live recording. Uh, streaming so it live, you, by the way, on Don's channel. We are, we are streaming it live on my YouTube channel. So uh, check that out. But uh, yeah, you can uh, find me on, on my website, doncom.ca. All my social links are there. Uh, and uh, so more on that when we get to the, the mid-show break. But uh, thanks for having us back on, Steve. This is always a fun gang to be with. It really is my absolute favorite thing of the month. 
Uh, quick reminder for everybody, if you want to get in on this, and a number of you uh, had left comments on Flickr, and for some reason, I did not get the alerts. I don't know why, but <laughs> if you want to join in on the critique shows, all you got to do is head on over to the Flickr uh, site and join the Behind the Shot group on Flickr. And then you can start submitting your images and having fun and just playing in the pool and getting comments. It's a great community. Uh, we've got some discussion stuff up there that, again, I didn't get the alerts on. I apologize to the people I was late answering on. But if you tag with a Flickr tag, not a hashtag, but a Flickr tag, if you tag your photos with BTS Critique, that's what we search for to find the photos that we use here. That's your way of kind of giving permission for us to use the pictures in the show, because I don't want to critique your shot if you're not ready for it. There's nothing absolutely wrong with that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so head on over, join the Flickr group. Again, it can be a free account, but as I said, and, and uh, Romy just said, uh, or agreed with in the chat, Flickr, in my opinion, is the best place to see photos online. They do such an amazing job of keeping everything really good looking, which brings us to this. And anybody chime in on this. The goal here is not to berate somebody to say, oh my God, what have you done, my eyes? That's I'm not out. our Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the... sorry. He's Cheap been joke. queuing Cheap up. Joke. He's been queuing up the bad words all day. Um, our goal here is not to make you feel bad. And so if you've never done a critique, please jump in. The goal here is to help you elevate your photography to the next level. This is a subjective form of art. You may love a shot and listen to us say, you know, it's not moving us. We think you should do X, Y, Z and go, you guys are idiots. You don't understand what I shoot. That's okay. It is absolutely fine for you to disagree with us on anything. But if at the end of it, you don't take away from it, man, but I never thought somebody would see my shot that way. If that's yeah. all you get from it, that's the whole point. And I'm going to do this probably every show now. Scott yeah. Kelby recently wrote uh, a great article called What to Expect from a Photo Critique. ScottKelby.com uh, slash what you can expect from a photo critique with hyphens or dashes in between each word. But if you Google it, you'll find it. It is a phenomenal kind of breakdown of what to expect uh, as you go through this. So with that yeah. in mind, let's dive in. And Andy, you've done this uh, multiple times before, so you know we always have our guests go first. And this particular shot is called a moody, misty morn. Yeah, I, I, I like this a lot. A, a lot of my reactions start off with, when I click the link that you sent, what was my first reaction? And yeah, I like this a lot. This is the sort of image that you want to spend time just looking at it. I would, uh, boy, if this were, if I, I could imagine how impressive this would be at a really, really large size. It, uh, it, it dialed in a lot of things that, I'm often thinking when I'm going through my own shots, and I, I should I, I should mention when we do these things, I I always start by saying that uh, I tend to I tend to talk about two things, like just as a just as a person looking at photos, what was my reaction to this, and when you're trying to assimilate what's being said, realize that whenever someone tells you this is this is how this made me feel, or this is what this is this is how I what I thought about this thing, they're always 100% correct about their own feelings. And then there's uh, later on, I will I will tend to say, the think about it as another person who has just dumped all their all, all their pictures into Lightroom is looking looking for the keepers, looking for the ones the rejects, and then deciding, gee, what would I like to do to this image to improve it. So, as and thank you by the way to everybody who submitted their their shots. I'm sorry that I'm I'm, I'm hemming and hawing instead of getting right into it. But uh, you, what your intro, Steve, really made me think of uh, the, the, one of my favorite uh, singers, uh, Joyce Dinanato, mezzo soprano. Uh, uh, she does amazing master classes. You can see them on YouTube that will just teach you about the creative process, teach you about the process of just discovery of what your voice is what you want to express in any given moment and she always starts off by saying that look uh, that, the, the, by praising all the students that have decided that, that they know that they are here to have their performances discussed and and talked about that's a very brave thing when you put uh, that hashtag on this photo and say that I'm, I'm not putting <laughs> you had the choice of putting it onto uh, the subreddit pictures forum with hey I just shot this last weekend what do you think which where the you're definitely saying I really want to be encouraged don't you know don't 
don't, don't kiss my butt, but if you could tell me nice things to get me to continue to do things, that'd be great too. You are saying, nope, there's going to be a discussion, not only the people who are on this show, but everybody who's following along. So thank you all of you, because it's such a great opportunity for all of us to learn and to just explore what makes these, what makes uh, uh, photographs tick. But yeah, I, I, I really, really like this a lot. Uh, there's, there's a thing that I keep thinking about whenever I'm looking at my own photos, where sometimes there, you take a picture where there isn't an immediate subject, there isn't a clear subject, it's more of an environment. And that's not wrong at all. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to play with mood, to just lean back and say, it's not important that there is, that I, I'm not, I'm not going to get some clip art of a bird and make sure there's a bird flying into the flame from left to right. Uh, it's, it works really, really well. I love that you appear to have played with the colors a lot here. Uh, that's another very deliberate choice you have to make. Uh, they, it, a lot of people would think, oh, I'm going to go warmer with this, but it wasn't just you went warmer. You decided to give this sort of ethereal mist to it. Um, uh, I'm always, whenever I'm looking at pictures in general that I'm editing, one of the things I tend to think that that's kind of on my to-do list is I do have a, a, a very, very powerful belief that it's the blacks that really anchor an image, that this is what yes. the user interface as your eyes go through. But I'm saying that in the, as a way of saying that that's not a hard and fast rule because I'm not sure that anchoring, uh, that manipulating this so that they're anchoring blacks, there are some deep blacks here would actually improve it. I really like the fact that it really is that gauzy. The only thing that, uh, the only comment that I would make is that maybe I would like to see uh if the crop shifted a little bit more to the left only because that's a really interesting tree and it's close enough to the center that my brain my, my photo looking at software inside my brain wants to think oh so it's a picture of this interesting tree what's so interesting about it uh again not 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 a problem per se but that's something that i would be playing with if i had this in front of me but yeah this is this is really really good stuff i liked it a lot uh don you want to go next so Andy uh, hit on a couple of points that I'd like to uh, echo and build on. The, the warm color temperature is, is really important for this image, uh, but and not the fact that it's warm. I mean, you could have gone cold too. You could have made this yeah. a very um, a very sort of wet and damp uh, scene by just- Which would have made this, by the way, a completely different yep. awesome shot. Oh, totally. Sad, uh, lost, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and so you have an entirely coverage. different feel uh, by by making that choice, and so it's a deliberate one to go in this direction, and you're not wrong to go either way. But I just want everybody uh, watching and listening to know that you have multiple choices that could make a very impactful image out of the exact same source material here. Um, talking about the uh, the darks in the image, I did notice that uh, particularly the, the trunk right in the middle, the very bottom part of it where it intersects with the uh, the ground is darker than everything above that. And there's one trunk a little bit further to the left that you can say the same of. And that typically would mean that um, uh, a graduated neutral density filter uh, or a graduated filter of some kind in Lightroom or whatever tool you're using was used to really richen the ground. And I agree with the choice uh, of doing that, but also subtract the bottoms of those trunks so that there's a bit more uniformity uh, within that sense. And uh, uh, also to, to Andy's point about that tree being kind of right in the center, I'd move left or right. I can see uh, to the, the left of the, uh, the trunk, there's a small little spindly tree kind of coming right up that uh, gets blocked a little bit above that horizon line. So maybe I take a step to the right so that that tree is properly hidden behind the main one and kind of giving um, not exactly a vanishing point moving down the center of the frame, but sort of like that where you've got a bit more open space and that's a little bit off to the side to create a different style of balance, but it's all personal preference at that point. Uh, one more thing that I might not agree with, but in the field I'd experiment with, uh, is this was shot at f11. I might take this shot at, say, f5. Just I, I like the fact that the mist is fading stuff off into the background, but you can also accomplish that doubly so by having your depth of field fade off as things go off into the mist and simplify the image possibly that way. It might not work, but I am, you know, that, that's one of the levels of experimentation in the field that I would be playing with. Okay, so I'm going to reiterate a lot of what both of them just said, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this. I don't agree with the shallower depth of field. I like the fact that in essence, the, yeah. the softness that I get in distance is still sharp, but it's the fog. I think if the sharpness of the trees in the fog were also lost, I think it would be too much 
right now I feel like I can walk through those trees and I love the treatment. I love the warm effects that you've put on here. And I actually even made a note because I'm doing so much. I, I write some notes because it's hard <laughs> for me to look at the picture big. I actually made a note that the depth of field here is awesome. Yeah. Right. Um, many, I think, would have blurred this shot too soon. But that all said, and by the way, Andy said he'd like to see this big. I got to say, this printed like two foot by three foot on aluminum <laughs> would freaking be awesome. The focal point, however, is the centered tree. And while I think that was intentional, I don't think it's the right choice. I think the scene as a whole is the subject with the tree being the foreground subject, the darker tree in the back being a background subject. I, I, I don't like it in the center is basically what I'm saying, because without, without symmetry, that center subject feels too heavy to me, too much attention to it. Um, and so to me, I'm looking at the lens you shot this with, and it said it was the 16 to 35 Mark II Canon. My favorite lens. It's sitting on the floor over here behind me because I'm selling mine because I bought all RF glass. But this was shot at 35, and I'd like to see it closer to 24. Maybe more towards the 16. That might be too wide. But around 24, I think I would get a little bit more width. Shift your focus or your feet camera to the left so that that tree moved to the right. And you see the dark tree on the far right that kind of angles into the scene? I don't need that. So if you shifted the entire point of view to the left, I think it would be a stronger image and get that, that off center. And really quick, we do have a couple of comments. Uh, Gary said, cool, moody shot, really like the tone, would just like to darken the upper left as my <laughs> eye keeps going there. That's, a, that's an interesting point. I kind of like that personally. Uh, anything else on this shot? Uh, only that the, what the, when your comments kind of racked another thing in, into focus. Oftentimes, when you're doing something that's environmental like this, you are putting the the observer in that place, and you are you're inviting them to come into it and create their own story. So that's another vote for me against against having that tree in the middle because that's blocking me from moving forward into this space. So just another thing to to think about it. Yeah, I completely agree. Let's jump over to image number two. And Don, if you want to go first on this one, it's a sip of summer. You know why I, thought, I had you go first. I thought you might ask. Yeah, I'm quite <laughs> yeah. familiar with uh, with these techniques and how uncooperative ants can be as actors. And there's evidence that I'll spot that nobody else will. So I'm just going to talk on some of those things for a little bit. Um, You'll notice that there's the main droplets in, in the front and the one that's uh, distorted that the ant uh, appears to be drinking from. But I know that ants just walk across the water as if they're not there, just running into them and knocking them about and so on. And you only know that from experience. And so that also shows me that there's some uh, streaking droplets on the left side of the frame, including one that's connected to the back of the ant's butt. It's kind of lifted up with the water there. Uh, so I know exactly this This ant was on a rampage through the water droplets until it sort of landed at this point, and you got a great shot of it interacting with one of those droplets. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, I understand how chaotic uh, this kind of configuration can be, but you also have some control over certain elements. And, and some of that was really useful. The alignment of the flower in the background is such that it appears very centered in the water droplets. However, the exact height of the camera lets you place the ant right behind the yellow bits. And so there's a really nice contrast uh, alignment that is happening there that uh, just kind of combines everything together in a, in a really nice way. Um, but these are all control choices. And so too is the surface that those water droplets are attached to, whether that's uh, hard to say if it's a twig or a flower petal, uh, or I mean, it's something natural, but it's somewhat ambiguous. And so I might have chosen something that was a slightly different color in the frame, uh, just to add a splash of something besides the purples and the yellows, or the, I guess, magentas and the yellows uh, in the image uh, that uh, would make that sort of platform of water droplets stand out a little bit more. And again, I just kind of look around me to figure out what works and what doesn't. And an entire day, it's so easy to spend an entire day 
on an image like this uh, and not get anything useful. So the fact that it, this uh, in the comments of it was a first attempt at doing this, that is worth beyond applause oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to uh, to walk away with this as a uh, uh, as an image. And, you know, th there are some uh, artifacts of uh, focus stacking that uh, around the, the big droplet in the very center, the lower right or sorry the lower left edge of it has a bit of an echoed edge because the droplet might have been moving as the ant was moving and multiple shots might have been taken for focus stacking and i know exactly how hard that is too with moving subjects so again further applause if i can spot any flaws in this image it's not because you didn't do a fantastic job it's only because i've walked down that exact same road before <laughs> okay so i'm gonna go next but first of all i just gotta pull this up because i like this terry actually said good shot madam butterfly <laughs> <laughs> because because melody is in the uh is in the conversation here so i think that's awesome all right so i'll go next on this one and a couple of things first of all don can speak to the technical as you can see much better than i can but to me this is a moment and uh andy said earlier when you first pull a shot up what's its impact so if you ever go into image competitions like ppa or even local they use 12 points of giving an image a merit or not. And number one, point number one, that's technically not ranked, it just happens to be the first, is impact. And it's the most important to me. When I look at an image the first time, does the image move me? And this one does. I think this is fantastic. That said, uh, the antenna are see-through. And I'd really love that fixed. I mean, literally, you can see through those antennas the way that it's done. I'm not sure if it's a Photoshop artifact or if it was moving and simply blurred. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, you know, in the focus stack missed that, but I'd love to see that. Also, the water drops to me seem, the ant is like tack sharp in an awesome way. The water drops seemed like they were manually sharpened and over sharpened a bit. Um, that's just me. I, I just think they're a little too prevalent. And last but not least is there are lens flares in the bottom right corner and in the center of the flower, and I would take those out. Uh, other than that, I'm going to leave that mostly to Dawn on this one. Andy, what do you got? Um, I had a hard time uh, figuring out what I wanted to say about this. My My first impact was that wow, on a technical level, this is a really, really well done picture. Like my my brain went to wow that's a that's an ant and wow it's so it's so it's tack sharp I really really love uh, the the lens effects that you're getting from those water droplets I just wasn't connecting to it as an artistic image or as a story and um, there's things I, I looking at it some more. I wonder if that if I would have had a different impression if you went way way tighter on the crop. Um, you, uh, I don't think that the that big big uh, pink shroud on the background is adding anything. We we through the water droplets we see the entirety of the flower that's behind it. So you can hint at it even more vaguely than what you're doing right now. Crop it so that. Uh, maybe from that one little tiny little water droplet on the left hand side of the twig and end it uh, at the margins of the uh, of the uh, the yellow fringe of the flower uh, tighter 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 so I'm not sort of hunting around a little bit with my eye um, it's I would also love I mean you get the shot that you get and getting a lot I thought see honest to god uh, honest to god Don I thought you were going to say well I could tell that you you had a dead ant there and that's how you got because because a real live ant doesn't charge through like that because okay so that's how no it was a live ant they didn't know ants were harmed in the production of this photo so you uh, as, as someone who shoots roller derby yeah I know you get what you get I would love to see I would I would have loved it if the the little ring of uh, of, of petals in the background was centered around the uh, around the ant so that he his butt wasn't wasn't like cutting off like the the, the left side of that uh, as a as a graphical element um but again it's the 
I'll, I'll, I'll get back to uh, the uh, opera master classes. The fact that you've got this, the, the technical stuff of this down is so impressive and so valuable because really the first step in any new art, even if it within the realm of photography and you're starting off with, let's say, macro photography uh, after f shooting other things for a number of years, you have to learn how just physically, how do I get a shot that's well lit and in focus and I manage these tiny things. Once you've got that, then you can start playing around with the creative expression with what kind of story you want to tell again what kind of a graphical image you want to see i mean i would uh, the, the fact that you've done all the work to get the technical stuff down means that i'm sure that I'm, you're going to be making some more photos that might connect with me on a, on a stronger level yeah and a couple of interesting comments first of all melody said no focus stacking to which <laughs> don replied i wonder what you know the the artifacts are and Melody made the comment, Don, I suspect it's due to the flash and pedal bouncing from the ants' movements. Yeah, and I was looking at the um, uh, the shutter uh, speed here, and it's at a uh, one sixtieth of a second um, shutter speed with a flash that fired. So. At that point, you've got two exposures happening simultaneously, one with ambient light and one with the flash. And if there was some movement uh, with the ambient light image uh, at 1 60th of a second, uh, then that's going to cause a number of artifacts. Steve, that'll also possibly cause the artifacts that we're seeing with the antenna being slightly see-through. So when you're doing an image like this, you want to try to make sure that the uh, majority of the light comes from the flash, which means you're operating at the flash sync speed. Uh, with most cameras, it's going to be one two hundredth of a second or something in the neighborhood of that. So keep that in mind for the next attempt. Uh, and I'll also state that um, you know when you're playing around with out of focus details of uh, of various colors. So in this case, we've got the magentas and the yellows and you try to increase their saturation, you get an artifact effect where it looks like you've got sharp edges on out of focus blotches of things. And I've encountered that before as well. It can be somewhat uh, annoying when you spot it and it can be also pretty hard to fix. You have to sort of manually go and blur those lines out if you're trying to oversaturate things to that end. The uh, software algorithms just haven't gotten there automatically to, to fix that yet. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, so let's jump to the next one. And the next image is called Coca-Cola for Everyone. And this is near and dear to my heart because I live on Diet Coke. <laughs> so let's just throw that out there. So a couple of things on this one. First of all, conceptually, I really like this. I like your color choices. I like the layout. What I'm going to mention here, uh, I, I will, let, let me start here. As a piece of art, I think the concept has a lot of potential. I think the setting that you set them up in uh, pulls that way, way back, right? In the right environment, on the right table, with the right background, I think this could be a fine art piece on a wall because it's just neat with the colored bottles. On the other hand, where, it's, where these bottles are sitting now, there are things that are detracting from that and make me not want to print it. For example, and some of these are minor and some of them are not. So if you look, the bottle tops are not all equal. So some of them are flat. Some of them, are like the second from the right, is clearly bent. I wish that they looked like they were all new, right? If you're going to do this, that consistency, and same thing, second from the right and third from the right, I can see the date stamp on the top of the bottle. But I can't on the other bottles. Actually, there's one other one I can see a little bit of. But the blue one and the two on the sides of it, I can see part of that text and not others. Uh, I can't read it, for example. Take that text out of there. You don't need any of that. And now to me, the big thing. The way you've got it on this dark table with a, a something lit up behind it, it almost looks like a light board. The edge between the table and the background is still too defined. I need that diffuse. I almost need it to look like it's on a seamless background. And because it's such a hard edge, it's reflecting that hard edge at the bottom of the bottles instead of smoothly gradiating that reflection inside the bottle. So I need something to change to kill that hard edge behind the bottles. Uh, the other thing is you have lens distortion here. The bottle on the left is leaning to the left. The, the bottom of the bottles is not straight. And for that matter, the bottom of the back table, the, the back edge of the table isn't straight. Those little things 
if you and and there's some spots on the bottles i'd literally go through at 200 300 percent i'd clean up all the spots on the bottles um most of that specifically by the way the blurring of that back edge so that it was softer in the table you'd have to almost do that in camera to make it clean those things could really elevate a shot like this uh andy yeah, I'm, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to echo uh, stuff that you've said. Uh, I think that uh, there, there are photos, and we're about to see some of them, I think, where you're capturing a moment. You're, you're saying to the viewer, this is something real. This is something that actually exists, and I took a picture of it. And then there are ones where you're saying, I'm going to create an environment. I'm going to create a mood. I'm going to create a graphic image for you. This is clearly a graphic image, and I, I, I like the color. I mean, don't, don't, as the saying goes, walk up to the bell, but don't tap the bell. Ring the bell. I mean, you get co colors that intense, you're ringing the bell. That is exactly uh, that's such a great thing to do um it reminded me of uh, of andrew warhol's silk screens where it's the same image repeated but just in different colors um this will so that give you know somebody else just made that same comment rich rizzo said yeah it sort of reminds me of an andy warhol feel yeah yeah it's uh, it, it, this is this is the and this really is the sort of thing where i've uh, i can i can tell you uh, I, i've had shared experiences i think like this where i took the picture uh, i looked at it and i really liked it then i realized that i'm going to do this again but now i'm going to fix this and then you take like over four months you keep redoing this again and again and again until you get this perfect line of identical graphic bottles and all the stuff you said uh all the stuff you said is absolutely true the thing that uh, that really caught my eye is that this re you really need to adjust the geometry of this through tilt shift yes. through whatever so that they're absolutely dead on vertical you can't have uh, you, you can't have uh if if uh, I, don't, I didn't know whether it was lens distortion or just simply the fact that uh, it's simply the fact that you know you're close to an object, and well, okay, that is lens distortion. But uh, I also didn't think that you'd lined up the bottles perfectly. They need to be exactly the same edge, exactly on the same line, left to right. I would be buying. I, I, I happen to I happen to know for a fact that when you buy bottles of Mexican Coke, they do come in a restaurant pack of twelve to whatever. I would be buying like I would be buying lots of these on a two biweekly basis, and every time I'd find a perfect coke bottle i would set that aside i would use acetone to get rid of the the, the spray painted on uh, date stamped I, I and once we get to the 10th 11th 12th iteration this is the point at which i feel as though this is so close to perfect but man now i can, I can tell that these are bottle tops that i just sort of flattened out and set on top of it this is where i'd go on amazon and say i wonder how much it costs to get one of those manual like bottle cap inserters to get it absolutely perfect yep. uh and also the uh, it's this is hard when you've got so many different intense colors i think that the uh, uh the when you look at the level of detail that you can see in terms of light highlights like on the orange one to the to the extreme left the the blue one uh over off to the right you see that uh, you don't see that same level of detail in the yellow and the green i would i would definitely be wanting to solve that problem probably by lowering the luminance so that i can still see that there's there's glass between uh the the green liquid and whatever comes forward but yeah this is this Again, this is this puts a smile on my face because this is what makes me happy when I'm doing photography. That, wow, that's not exactly what I wanted. I can't wait to do it again because now I, now that I've seen it, I know what I need to fix. And then, and honest to God, by the time you get to the eleventh, the twelfth iteration, you are like. I am trying to beat myself up as hard as possible, but I cannot find a single thing wrong with this. This is such a perfect expression of a simple idea. And as much as we love like street photography where, wow, they captured that decisive moment of this really chaotic scene, there's also something about you picked a really simple idea and your artistry, your creativity wasn't executing it flawlessly, perfectly, exactly the way that you wanted it to happen. So please keep working on this because this is a yeah. good idea. Don? Two quick things, because you guys have talked through most of the points that I was going to mention. Um, dark field illumination. So you can you can illuminate the bottles as they are, or roughly as they are, without having the background being as bright as it is. 
And I kept focusing my eyes, sort of Andy mentioned the spacing between the bottles. Mm -hmm. My eyes kept going to the spaces between them and, you know, kind of paying attention to that visually because that's technically brighter because it's bright white or very close to white. Um, so I would experiment with the angle of the lighting. Um, I did a uh, photograph just for fun playing with food photography recently of, uh, of a mug of beer. And so I, I know that you can do this and you can have the background dark and you can have the, the liquid illuminated and, and so on and so forth. That's a possibility. But number two, it's not just what's passing through them. Pay attention to reflections in the very bottom of the bottles uh, where it gets darker and look into the reflection. Hello, Mr. Photographer in the room that you're standing in. Uh, <laughs> most visible in the green bottle, but also yeah. once you spot it, you can see it in all of the others yeah. as well. So as soon as you see it, you can't unsee that. And I'll no. leave it there. Thank yeah. you for okay. wearing pants. <laughs> yes, thank you for wearing pants. And we have a couple of good comments. And we just so happen to have Freddie, Santee Photo uh, and Beverage Photography as Freddie Clark. Freddie is the one who came up with the idea for the Wanderers Photo Workshops. The one that we're doing in New Orleans was going to be next month, has been moved to January, wanderersphoto.com. He is an amazing food and beverage photographer. And he said, A, he said a couple of things. Goof off, we'll take the text stamps off. Uh, let's see, where's the next one I was going to pull up? I just jumped on me. There we go. Um, there we go. I love this one. Oh, no. This one. Uh, where'd it go? Right there. Uh, Bob says his Jack Daniels in the Coke would have totally blown the really good shot. Uh, I'd be right there with you, except I don't mix my Jack Daniels with Coke. Uh, Gary said likes the colors, but agree that everything just needs some Photoshop work, right? Cleaning everything up. Uh, and I want to do this one really quick from Freddie also, because he says lighting approach leaves it, the image feeling flat, not seeing the roundness of the bottles, not just the detail, but the roundness. And so you need some side light uh, for that. So there we go with with the image uh, on Coke. Uh, so let's jump to the next one. And this one, Andy, you go first. It's Tunnel of Love. Uh, nice moment between these two. The very first thing I thought is that this is very flat. Um, this is you, one of the gifts that you get when you take a portrait with a tunnel is that it will you automatically get for free. It will the dark you will get darkness receding behind the, the 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 subject. And so if you can bounce illuminate the the the, the people in the front or add some flash, you are immediately pulling not only pe pulling focus to uh, the, the 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 couple in the foreground, but also you are uh, you are getting giving this natural vignetting effect. Um, I did read the the, the details. Say okay, so you actually set up speed lights to illuminate uh, illuminate the tunnel. So that's de that's definitely a choice. It's it's in conflict to my eye simply as a viewer that I want to start thinking that, okay, so if you're illuminating the inside of the tunnel, what you wanted to do was instead of giving these subjects a dark background to uh, to give them focus, you wanted to give them a light focus, but then you've got like the well-exposed like na nature of the park behind them, and that's just cluttering things up. Um, the black and white is nice because it's not just simple, like, you know, <laughs> newspaper black and white. There really is some finesse here into the way you did the toning. This is an area in which I do think that giving it some good anchoring blacks would help this out a lot. Because, um, like I said, the, my, my first impression was just that it's a very, very flat image. Not a bad image at all. But you really needed something to pop these two people uh, in, the, in the foreground. This, is, this isn't a mood piece. This isn't an art piece. You are really trying to get people to take a look at the, at the emotional connection between these two people. And anything that you do that gets people wondering, hey, I wonder, if, is, is that a trash barrel? Like, between them, like in the distance there? Uh, thinking or like, the same gee, thing. Yeah. And you know, it is. And, that's, <laughs> and it is. I, 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 it it kind of it kind of it kind of diffuses the the intensity of the emotional moment. That's all I'm saying. Nothing will ever come between us, Don. <laughs> <laughs> uh, except the trash along the path in the future. Um, but yeah, no, it's I, I agree, Andy. It it feels almost like you have to have uh, a bit of a separation between their faces and the lightness, especially when you have the spaces between the trees in the background and that wonderful bokeh, bokeh, however you pronounce it, that's interacting right between their gaze. It's almost like it's interfering with it. And so if the camera was slightly higher, now you enter into some different problems where if the camera was higher than uh, the 
uh, the top of the woman's head might interact with the curve of uh, uh, of the tunnel itself. So you've got to be careful. But just to hide some of that, to make the background behind them, not even just the tunnel itself, but on the other side of the tunnel, to be darker still. Uh, so there could be some level of experimentation to be had there. If this is uh, based on uh, symmetrical uh, architecture, always, always try to make sure that you maintain that symmetry as best as you can. And so if you look in the very bottom right corner, you've got some diagonal lines that just about hit perfectly into that corner moving forward, but you don't have that in the uh, lower left-hand corner. It would need to be cropped in a little bit. That's also evidenced by the top left versus the top right, and you can see those edges don't balance out exactly. Um, this should all be symmetrical so that there's fewer distractions that frame it very clearly towards these individuals. Um, you know, and there's little bits of clutter around, including that garbage can that, that can be removed so that the focus is really clearly on that gaze, that connectivity between these two people. Now, I'm not a portrait photographer, so I can't really talk about posing to a great way, but I can see both of their hands in the foreground. And then the man's left hand in the background, you can kind of see his sleeve uh, just a tiny little bit above the, the woman's scarf. And it's almost as if I want to see that hand somewhere there, because I know it's there or just not. behind the scene. Or, yeah. or, or, or not, like I, it could be lower. Uh, but yeah. like it's just right on the edge of being seen. Like, is he trying to caress the side of her face? Well, I'd like to see that if that's the case, uh, rather than it says, is, she, is he just like holding on to her scarf? Because that doesn't sound very comfortable at all. Um, there could be some emotive connection there that is just being missed within the, the, the way that they're posed together. So, okay, I'm going to start here. This image in image competition would get what, what I call green merits, right? It would get green points. The person in the picture or their family will pay you for this. It's a cute photo of a couple and I'm sure they love it. And if you're the photographer charging for this, you're going to make some money. That's great. I like the treatment actually. I think the black and white that you did on the couple and for that matter even with what you've created in the tunnel i think you treated it very very well and then we get to the way you lit it now i rarely comment on the descriptions that are on these photos but in this one they said that they used two flashes behind the couple and here's what that did in my opinion you took a layered image you took an image where the couple was there and then you had leading lines going back behind them that would have been nice and moody and dark so that they stood out as foreground in the subject and the background then maybe just a hint coming back in to accentuate those leading lines. And you lit it all up and brought the tunnel and the background up in to being the subject with the couple. Yeah. That's the problem with the image is that now when, when people are saying, when my two others here are saying that it's flat, it's not even flat lighting wise. The lighting on the couple actually is very nice. It's very flattering. It's flat image wise. You've taken away the third dimension. Somebody made a comment, uh, who was it? Matthew said, what's with the halo around her face? Well, that's the two flashes that are in the background. Don referenced the hands. First of all, her hand, I don't mind. His right hand, that I only see three fingers and they're spread apart like this. And that's not a comfortable looking pose. I would have had his fingers together, moved his hand down to where I could see his whole hand. And the hand in the left seems awkward being up like that. Drop it down to her waist as well. There's no reason for me just to see the bend in his arm. It, it just doesn't look natural. I like your angle at eye level. Um, I wish... I don't know if it would be moving back and using some lens compression from a different lens. I wish their heads, their height difference is going to make this hard. I understand that. I wish the 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 rim of the tunnel didn't go through her forehead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be so much more comfortable either if their heads were in a clean spot in the tunnel or out of the tunnel, I think would be really good. And this is the last one. Yes, this is a nice moment because we can all imagine what the moment is. But in truth, when I looked at her face... What I saw was her saying to him through her slightly pursed lips, is he done yet? Has he taken the picture? I don't, <laughs> I don't see, I don't see romance in her eyes or her facial expression. I see I'm posing, I'm ready. And so I would, I would possibly look at, at, at those type of changes. Don't misunderstand me though, for what you got again, 
they would buy this and be very happy with it. Yeah. Next image, uh, well, Don. Well, hold on, Steve. Uh, well, yeah. One final thing on on the previous shot. There's yeah. I, and I just it bothers me so much because it's right in the middle of the frame. There's a hair coming out of the man's nose. Like just kind of oh. almost horizontally out. <laughs> Hold on, I wasn't going. I wasn't going that closely. So yeah, I'll, I'll go. go. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's like right, right, right in the, the dark area of the background. See if I can get it. Uh, right there. Well, yeah, sort of right in front of his nose. Yeah, yeah. And, right and there. so that that is such an easy uh, edit to remove. <laughs> but as soon as I see it, it's like, oh, she's looking at the nose hair. Uh, and it, it completely transforms the the purpose of the image, uh, and that's that's not in a good way. Okay, we're we're, 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 we're laughing, but this this does. But to, uh, to to be more helpful, this is this this shows that what what a high level of difficulty that uh, this photographer that, that Joe has chosen for this. You really have to have there there, there are situations in which again, hey, I'm I'm a street photographer. I'm doing uh, surreptitious snaps. I'm 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 waiting for the moment to come to me, and I'm just trying to react and get to it. When you have something like this you it's it's so easy to be focused on the 999 details that have to be perfect that you overlook one other detail that until you got the pictures back uh, into into lightroom that have to be absolutely perfect as well so again high level of difficulty on this and yeah, that's, yeah. that's not that's not carelessness that if that's just yeah. an indication of how much work is it costs to do a posed picture like this particularly under the pressure of you know that this is going to or uh, i don't I don't know if these are hired models or these i think they're actually friends of the photographer but yeah uh, the, knowing that this is going to be on this couple's sofa for the next 40 years and if you've done your job right there's going to be whatever underlying tension there has always been between these two's kids is going to intense no no I get the sofa picture, okay? That's always been my sofa picture. I don't know why you think that you're going to get the sofa picture. Where all the stuff we're going through, <laughs> trying to get this house sold to, to deal with all this drama, why you uh, that's you kind of want to install a, a really big fight in the in, in the in the in the relatives of the family uh, after in 80 years when you're when they're closing down the house. And I'll add, I took a band out one time, five guys, four guys, uh, to do some promo shoots, and I'm positioning the guys and I'm worrying about the lighting and it took the friend of mine that was with me Troy Miller to go I can see the phone in their pocket <laughs> and they had this giant square in their pocket he's a wedding photographer and his <laughs> business is making sure that things aren't in pockets during oh, you know formal so that type of thing does happen and uh, again Romy had a really interesting point here and said he wonders if there would be enough separation if they didn't use the flash behind them, I think there would be, but, but uh, yeah. So let's jump to the next shot. Don, you want to go first on upside down. Love the moment. Um, love, love the, the separation between the legs and the air, the one hand, you can see all the fingers separated. Uh, I love the fact that this is done uh, with some pretty intense uh, backlighting to create the silhouette. You've got the sun just over the horizon. So the time of the day uh, is great for that, unless you wanted to, be playing with flash or whatever but it just kind of feels playful uh and light and uh and free but you know photography is a subtractive art you got to narrow things down to the core ingredients um and and part of the the thought process for me is i, I look around an image and i think okay well what doesn't need to be in the frame like what what does not support the subject or the narrative or the overall mood and is there a way to remove it? And it, I would crop in pretty ex ex extensively on this image. I don't need the lamppost on the side. In fact, I could even cut off the left half of the bench. I'm assuming this is a bench here. Uh, I can get rid of most of the building, if not all of the building uh, as well, and really make this a play about this person just kind of jumping over this bench and making it really about that moment, that character. But if I do that with the silhouette, the way that it's currently shaped, the person's head is like just under a semicircle of the silhouette. Like you would have to try to coach the person to I do this multiple times and say, okay, review the results next time, you know, just stick your head out a little bit more uh, just so that your, your body, your shape is a little bit more conducive to the fact that it will be a silhouette and you're not going to get a facial expression, but maybe you could get like an edge of a nose or a chin or something that raises through that shape and form of the face because you're not going to see the face at all. Um, and, and if that's the case, then I might even, if, if I was to, to, to be so much of a, uh, a persnickety photographer, which I am, uh, I would uh, ask the person doing the jumping, 
correct, maybe it's the photographer. It might be a uh, a self-portrait, but then you could review it and maybe arch your one hand a little bit that is touching the bench such that there's a little bit of a space between the hand uh, and, and the bench, again, to draw a little bit of extra contrast to exactly where that point of connection is. I was going to say that I don't like the tilted angle, and I don't like it in this larger framing, but if I were to condense things down, I might even want to tilt it even farther uh, just to show that the world is kind of in a bit of a spinny contour to the person that is flipping themselves upside down. And I don't mind it in that context. Okay. So that's in, you said something that I agree with a hundred percent and I find it interesting that we agree on this. So first of all, love the silhouettes. I love all silhouettes. I think you can do such amazing things with shape, right? With the, with the, the geometry of a human form. Um, nice time of day. Love the timing that you took this, the warmth on the wall on the side. Here's where it gets interesting. So to me, either you level this image, which you didn't leave enough on the ground to do. If you rotated this image level and trued all your vertical lines, you're gonna lose the bottom of the bench and you need ground in front of the bench. But I don't mind the Dutch angle if, as Don said, you bring the crop in. So there's a weird, like you can see the building with the doors on the right. And then right on the right, there's like this square that's sticking into the frame. I don't know what that is. It's part of a building or something, but I'll call it a box for sake of, of conversation. If you cropped in past that, that would also bring the jumper to a rule of third and then crop down a little bit, keep the same ratio that you have now. Then at that point, I think the Dutch angle works for you and makes this a, a little bit stronger, but you don't need that much sky. You don't need that box on the right. I wish that the sun wasn't blown out. Like I would almost rather you over accentuated this darker to keep the sun that would richen the colors even more. And you could bring back a little bit of shadow where you needed it to. And at the same time, I would, there's no reason to leave that little sliver on the left so that the light pole is in there. I'd take that light pole out. Not that I'm against light poles. There's another one next to the bench. I might remove that one. Probably not. It's just the one standing clearly on its own kind of kind of bothers me a little bit. Andy? Yeah, this is one where I just had no connection to it whatsoever when I saw it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's... Uh, there, and again, where I'm kind of... I really have to look at... I really had to look at it and think about it to think about... Uh, what makes an image work for me personally as a viewer and what doesn't so this is why this is these are always valuable experiences not just for the photographers but for the people who are looking at it and trying to ask themselves that question right uh, I, I i do think there's way too much information here there's you're giving a lot of context to this to the scene that doesn't tell any part of the story it's not important that there's a building off to off to the right there it's not important there, there are light poles. You've got the sky, which is a beautiful like sunset sky. You don't need to show quite so much of it because the sky as a whole isn't that dramatic. So any section of it is gonna serve your purpose. The I didn't know what the guy was doing. Uh, you, the caption said he was free running. I didn't know, was he doing a handstand? And this is him coming out of the handstand. I mean, meaning that I didn't know he was free running. I just thought that maybe he was just goofing around or he was just doing a vault over the, over the thing. Uh, Part of the, uh, one big part of the problem is that, I'm oh, sorry, I, I, I shouldn't identify it as a problem. I'm saying one observation that I tend to have about my own stuff is that if you're going to go for real silhouette, I mean, this is just a shape of black. That has to be a very specific and careful choice. I find that most of the times where I'm, again, I'm looking at these little thumbnails inside Lightroom and I'm thinking, oh, wow, that's such a dramatic and wonderful shot. And wow, I just love how stark the contrast is between the, that figure and the background. I'm When I start getting to the nitty gritty of editing it and processing it, I realize that uh, I actually, I, that it's the, the, the contrast works even if I give more information to the viewer, if I increase some of the levels so that I can see that very rarely do you take a picture where you have 100% black silhouette. You have there, when you're, when you're in the place and you're looking at this person, even background backlit by, by the sunset, you will see lighter elements to their clothing. You will see lighter elements to their skin. And so that's information that you're deciding not to give to the, uh, to the viewer. And you have to ask yourself, is it worth the choice? Is that really what I want to do? Um, as such, 
I would have tried to make things come out. Uh, I, I would try to give more light here. Uh, the thing that that I've uh, I, I put myself into the position once again of uh, I'm looking at the shots that I took today because uh, I finally got home and looking at what I got. Um, so this is again f through the mind of what Andy would do if he were had taken this picture. This would have been my thought of wow, you know that there there was something there, but I didn't really get it. What I would the next time I'm in this position, uh, uh, rather uh, uh, rather the ne the next time I decide that hey I'm, I'm going to be taking a long walk of, uh, and I'm going to be walking through uh, the Copley Square, which is usually in Boston where like the skateboarders and the skaters are like doing their tricks. There's a, there's a lot of surfaces to grind on. Uh, so I'm you know what. Now, especially now that light is that the, the sunset is getting earlier, I'm going to bring a pocket flash with me because that would have been so rad to have that not only freeze that motion of this person doing that vault or doing that flip, but also the intensity of the color that I would have gotten from that foreground and the way that would make that figure pop against the 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 very very calm sedate beautiful like natural background uh that's uh, that's not a that's obviously not a new invention that's almost the I, I, you might even call it a cliche of like skateboard photography of that kind of act, street action photography but damn the one another way to uh, another way to define the word cliche is people do it because it works there's, there's a reason why people put salt on fries it's not uh, it's not subtle but man it, it makes it makes the, the flavor of those fries really pop so I, I hope I said something that was helpful or interesting or illustrative but really the the only really important thing I think that I can say is that I looked at this and I just would have clicked the next uh, the, the arrow button to get to the next one it just didn't connect to me and, and I'm going to add, because Andy just said something that triggered something. I could totally see this as an Atiba Jefferson skateboard shot. And yeah. Atiba pops flash and doesn't blend flash. He wants you to see that yeah. it was flash. This could be really artifice, cool that Artifice, way. artifice, artifice, yeah. Yes. Some, 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 sometimes artifice is you don't want to hide it. Sometimes it really is. I'm going to shout out loud and proud that I would want to blast this person because the energy that this person is doing in the middle of this trick and this middle of this kick or this flip, I want you to be able to see the spit flying out of their mouth. And I don't care if you know exactly that I had that I, I had a I had a, a regular flash in front of them and a blue tinted flash behind them because that's what that's the choice that I made. So yeah, go and and Atiba's been on the show before. Go look up that episode because it was really, really good. And the last thing I want to say is Don talked about the posing. Renee Robin, when she was on the show, there were these things with the hands, and I was like, how detailed do you get? She she coaches them and does it over and over until the fingers are in the right position. So definitely <laughs> do that. Uh, real quick break time. I just want to, we'll jump back into more shots in a minute. But again, I always have to say thank you because Andy, when he is on this show, he has an in, it's not even your insight, man. Andy has a way of wording things that I can absorb. And I don't even know anybody absorbs anything I say. So I appreciate the fact that when I say things, I, I can absorb them from Andy. So Andy, again, where can everybody find you? What are you doing these days people need to know about? Uh, the price of admission on the Andy Anatko flume ride is to spell my last name. If you go to Anatko on Twitter, Anatko on, on Instagram, I'm in the process of rebuilding my blog for uh, like repurposing my writing, but that's supposed to be Anatko.com. But it's again, it's in the process of rebuilding, so don't expect anything there. Uh, and as you can always go to Twit TV, Relay FM, and WGBHnews.org uh, to listen to what I've been saying recently. Uh, it's a I cover a lot of topics. I try to explore as much as I can. So hopefully people will, I, my, my goal is that even if people think that I'm talking rubbish, at least will make them think about why they think I'm talking rubbish. And hopefully I, 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 I win more than I, often than I lose in that, in that endeavor. WGBH in Boston, which you can live stream when Andy's on, uh, Mac Break Weekly on twit.tv with Leo Laporte, usually Alex Lindsay, Renee Ritchie, and then a material podcast uh, with Florence Ion on Relay FM. And Don, where can people find you? What are you doing? What do people need to know about? Well, uh, people need to know that uh, in maybe a month and a, and a bit, I am moving to Eastern Europe, to Bulgaria, uh, to my wife's home country, and it will be a permanent move. And I don't know when I'm going to be able to, or if I'm going to be able to move my inventory of books over there with me. I still have about 800 or so that I would like to sell and get into the hands of wonderful photographers. So. If you want a 384 page hardcover book on macro photography, uh, you should go to skycrystals.ca. 
you can find that link through all my social media stuff or just get in touch with me personally. It's, I'd love it's, to uh, get that. It's book in out the to show you. notes also below and on the website and it popped up on screen just now. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants a print from me, I've been doing a ton of printing lately because people have gotten the word that I'm not going to be on this continent uh, anymore. So uh, yeah, I'd be more than happy to continue along with that. And just a final plug, uh, at, after this, whenever we're done with this, Steve and I will probably take a few minutes break and then on my YouTube channel, start up the next episode of Photo Geek Weekly for anybody that wishes to, uh, to tune into that as well. Okay, perfect. And one other thing I wanted to add, because I was thinking about it and, and Romy made a comment uh, you know, that he didn't like the tilted horizon on that one shot. When you do a Dutch angle, that kind of tilt on a shot, there are reasons for that. Usually photographers use that to build or add to tension. Uh, one of the most iconic shots, in fact, I had Dennis Reggie on the show talking about um, John Jr. and, uh, uh, what was it? I'm trying to remember John Jr.'s wife's name. Jacqueline? No, can't remember it now. Uh, coming out of the church, and he took that with a Hasselblad back in the day and it was tilted and it just added to the energy and stuff like that. So usually if you're gonna do that type of a Dutch angle on something, it, it's, it's not just cause you didn't have your camera level when you snapped the shot, right? You leave it in there because you wanted to, to say something as it were. So let's jump into the next shot. This one, I will go first and it's called 266, 365. So I'm guessing that means it's shot number 266 of a 365 project watching the ships roll in and a couple of things first of all super nice black and white like really i don't know if it's coming through the video go look at this on Flickr. the treatment of this black and white the softness gorgeous in this image and i'm gonna say whether or not i like the image is immaterial here the way <laughs> you did this black and white andy talked about solid blacks look at that gas tank Look at that gauge, yet I can read the numbers. Just a really, real, the bike is so clean looking and it has kind of an aggressive vignette on it, which normally I'm not a fan of. I actually like it here, it kind of works. Here's where the shot itself is kind of, I don't wanna say falling apart, that's the wrong phrase. I think it's losing a lot of impact that this image deserves. I mean, this is so beautiful. It deserves all the impact. And I think you took some of your own impact away. As an example, because you're shooting straight down the pier on the right, there is another like remnants or something like boat dock on the left. Because you're shooting straight down it with the bike straight at it, here's what's happening. The people at the end of the pier are intersecting the post on the side. The bike is intersecting the ship out in the distance. If you moved your body to the right, that would allow you to position, I don't know if I can even do this, but I'm gonna try and it may take me a, but imagine, I'm gonna guess, it right there for the handlebar, lower than that. Let me do that one more time. Imagine the handlebar coming up around the ship like that, the bike, in that open spot in between, head in a clean spot, your subject here is kind of the bike, get the bike in a clean spot, the ship wouldn't be intersected. By moving to the right, the people would separate from the post on the right a little bit. Heck, I'd go down there and ask them to stand between them and not so close to the post. I think that you would have immediately a much stronger shot. And by turning yourself to the right, that would angle the boat dock and the pier giving you a little bit more of some kind of cool angled leading lines. And I, I just think it would be more powerful. Uh, let's see, Andy. Uh, so much of what you said, I agree 100% with. This is such a beautiful black and white image. And this is exact, what a great instinct you had to drop the color from this. Sometimes you just, you, you, your brain does you a favor and realizes that, wait a minute, there is no information being transmitted by the colors in this image. If anything, I could make this thing more focused by removing the colors entirely and just simply choosing what tone I want overall uh, to present because you can you can you can convey so much emotion just by uh, just by having a black and white image that looks to be black and white but subtly it's a little bit warm or subtly it's a little bit 
blue or even subtly it's a little bit purple that where you'd have to live with it for a while before you'd realize that wait a minute that's not black and white at all and maybe that's why i find that i think that this has a fantasy element to it instead of a realist element to it uh there's and that's uh, if that's your motorcycle it's a gorgeous motorcycle this is why it's it's yeah, you, know, you you have to you have to expect like you 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 come out of the Applebee's and there are three people with their iPhones taking a picture of your motorcycle because it's such a beautifully easy to photograph uh, sort of thing. You've got the right level of detail because it would it would be a shame if you didn't have that enti- the entire thing in detail uh, in in sharp focus uh, from start to finish because you, your eye just wants to stay on it. Um, that's and, and that's. I wouldn't call it a problem, but I'm, the, the, I, we're going once again at immediate reactions. Uh, I want to spend so much time looking at this motorcycle that I, I'm not really looking at the story that's behind it. And that's kind of a shame because you've got a great story going on behind there. Uh, I love where you've positioned yourself uh, on this dock. I love that you've put you've put the dock compositionally there, like a third uh, to the uh, to the uh, from the right there, uh, because it really just makes the thing just so dynamic and so lively. Um, I, yes, it would be great if uh, if the figures were a little bit better separated so they weren't blending into the posts. I would never have the guts to walk up to strangers, especially on a dock, and say, "Hi, uh, can I take your picture?" And can you do this and that? <laughs> I I would never. I, yes. I I don't want I don't, I don't want to eat my camera so <laughs> I don't have the I don't have the guts to do that um the 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 other thing that I would that I would say that and I don't think this is nitpicky but this is maybe not something that everybody would get as uh, locked on as I would uh the 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 side mirror there on the on the left I really don't like that it's lining up with the edge of that dock so well because it the the brain the fact that it's also the same sort of tonal value as the as the dock the brain has to process that intellectually to realize that that's not part of the dock structure it is it's not it's not uh, it's not it's it really is part of this foreground object and I, and yes i know that you look at it for more than a half a second you realize that oh no there isn't a bit there isn't a huge blob that's on that, that's been painted onto this uh, this surface but that's the sort of thing where uh, that's the sort of reason why I'm a much better photographer uh, in this world of digital than I ever was as a kid with film, because I would get home and realize that I'd blown it uh, with my with my digital cameras. It's oh wow, that's right. I should probably I should probably turn the handlebars this way or that way. The only other thing that I would mention is that this is this is such a great storytelling image, really. That uh, and the story that the observer is going to come up with might not be the one that you intended, which is part of what makes photography and art just so arresting and so valuable. Um, the question—I'm not saying you did anything wrong. I'm saying that the questions that I would want to be addressing or uh, or dealing with as I was composing this image and processing it is that whose motorcycle is that? Does it belong to one of the people on the dock? Were they going out for a ride? They decided to park there and go forward. Is it the the? Are, am I the observer? the person on the motorcycle where gee i thought i was going to have a nice private moment here but okay there are a couple of guys there i'm not going to turn around and go back but i'm going to keep my distance because i don't want to engage with this person i'm obviously standing next to it i'm not sitting on it again these are not observations of here's what you should have done here are mistakes that were done here is the right way to do that but these are all parts of the story that you're telling just the difference of i am standing i as the observer am standing next to the motorcycle i am not sitting on the motorcycle it means that i've been there for a little bit of a while so you that's the, those the, the fascinating questions that you ask yourself as you're trying to put together uh, an image like again uh, I, I, every photo is a lie uh, all fiction is a lie as well we get to decide what story that we're telling and sometimes we have to make sure that all of the facts of our story are consistent because that's when we really get to the emotional connection that we kind of want to have with people so don before you go i want to pull up the, these comments really quick uh, Gary said, wondering what the white mark is on the right side halfway down. And I'll be honest, I had not seen this. Yeah. But yeah. there is a, a mark the bird. right there. The, and the bird above it. Uh, and the bird. And so, so a little, little cleanup would help. Um, Terry asked, is the vignette too heavy? And it ends out that the person who took the picture is actually here, um, which is Bob. For your information, I was sitting on my bike, but appreciate the <laughs> composition comments uh, for sure. Do me a favor, Bob, before before Don comments on this or when you hear this comment. Um, and Steve, by the way, said cropping the things on the right. I don't, don't necessarily agree with that. But uh, what did you do this black and white in? I want to know. So anyway, Don, what do you got? 
So uh, sort of what uh, Andy was saying, uh, and, and also um, uh, Freddie in the chat, uh, also uh, echoing on the same point, th this is all about being in uh, in the presence of, of a narrative of a story. I mean, you're trying to figure out what puzzle pieces sort of fit together. Freddie said um, that there's two cool photos here, the bike and then the people on the pier with the boat. They just need to be separated from one another. And, and I think you're, you're right, Freddie, to say that. But, but I also think that there could be some way to connect the two together. And my thought process for this image was how could you possibly make the bike feel more connected to the scene that it is in front of. It's not like it's a road that you know the bike is going to go down uh, in front of it. That would be an obvious connection between the uh, the landscape and, and the bike itself. So, I mean, what could you do? Could, could you have taken the bike into the sand just to do a little loop around uh, so that you had some tire tracks from the motorcycle in the sand that would connect things together just to say that you took the bike closer to the water? I wouldn't do that with a motorcycle like this myself, but I'm just trying to find ways to connect it. Maybe there'd be like a, a fishing rod leaning against the side of the bike to say why you had gone down to this pier uh, and that you know you intended to do some recreational fishing by having the fishing rod, just something. Um, that would allow a connection between those two different ingredients. And I don't know what it is. The examples I could think of off the top of my head, I don't think would be good enough to execute a way to improve the image. But I think that something like that would be needed uh, to, to cross the line of just gelling it all together. And that's well, pretty much all I got. I did want to comment on the uh, uh, the vignetting. I don't like the heavy vignette in the corners so equally and so heavily. But really? what might work with an image like this is if you were to uh, use a graduated filter and just darken down the entire top equally and the entire bottom equally. So you have like a top and bottom vignette, but you don't do anything on the sides. Uh, I think that might be uh, a pleasing effect here. You can always play with it. Uh, also, Bob did say he did this just in Photoshop with uh, black and white and a slight touch of tone. Mm -hmm. um, nice job. Yeah, just really. Yeah, and Gary said I was muted. I was. I was muted a second ago because I was coughing. Um, so, okay, <laughs> next image. It happens. Uh, next image, Andy gets to go first, and I'm dying to know what he's going to say about this one. This one is called Simpatico. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this a lot. This is it's, it's one of my favorite types of photography, uh, hanging out at a museum and trying to be as invisible po as possible and see how people are relating to the sculptures and, and the art. I, I am the person, I am that weirdo who's trying to be in the shadows because there's a beautiful sculpture of like a dancing figure. And I know that if I wait there for 33 minutes, I will get eight pictures of people taking selfies, trying to mimic that pose. Uh, so yes, I'm very simpatico here. It's very, very effective too. I love the high contrast uh, look that you went here. Uh, the uh, It was such a gift to have this person who was dressed so snappily, but also in, 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 in dark muted tones like that. Um, the uh, it's uh, yeah I, I would have I would have liked to see more more room underneath that image I really think there should be more floor and uh, behind her uh, for this image the uh, I had a moment when I first looked at this and by the way my first impression was oh this is so cool so that's so, so you got me um, the uh, the um, I might have considered doing some manipulation on the painting just to make it a little bit more clear what it is um I'm, I'm trying to solve this i'm trying to solve my personal problem here as i'm as i'm looking at it um sometimes i think that there was a small bit of confusion on my part because it took me a while to realize that okay she's looking at a painting this isn't like a hole in a wall this isn't like a a, a, a splash of paint that's on a wall uh, it, there's nothing there i don't see the little informational card that might be like right next to a painting in a museum uh, or at a gallery it doesn't immediately uh, tell me that she's in a museum that's that's absolutely not necessary but it would have helped me to decode things a little bit uh some of the things i would be playing with if I had this image, and, and believe me, if I'd taken this image, this would have gotten like that four star and a flag that I use inside Lightroom to say, get back on this and keep messing around with this because there's something great here. I would have considered something like, even if I had to do it artificially, take the wall and make it a little bit more gray, just so that the painting pops and defines itself a little bit more. That's something that I would 
try but honestly that could be totally the wrong thing because part of what makes it so attractive is that you just have stark black and stark white uh there's a uh, boy again really good instincts here i love that you waited and you got this grab um actually the only other thing i would say that then this this is where i kind of fight with myself about uh the line between trying to manipulate an image so much that you're trying to make it quote perfect inside your uh, inside your head uh, boy, I really wish she were wearing just flat black shoes. I really wish she weren't wearing sneakers with that white uh, sole on it because that stops her from being like a human shaped hole cut into this into this image. And I would love to see how that would happen. So again, one of the experiments that I would be try I would try is that I'm gonna get out the old paintbrush and just paint over those white soles so that they look like I'll make them so dark that they look like they're just sort of like a dark gray sole because they're still some there's still some detail in her face once again rarely do you have a silhouette that's a complete silhouette i love that you didn't go so far with this that you didn't distinguish her i'm what i'm guessing is a mask but it could be just a just a, a face tone uh, from there i love that again even as dark as this is you can see that there's a different fabric that she's got uh, on her leggings and on the coat as I, mostly mostly i'm praising things about this there there you can you can have lots of things you can you can play with this to see if, what you want to do with it and how you want to take it to the next level but yeah this is like mo this is the sort of picture that i take r rarely enough but i'm thankful for it where i think okay andy all you can realize that you can improve this but the number of steps you can take before you've totally screwed this up is a very low number so decide what exactly you want to do do only as much as needs to be done and then break off the right protect tab on this picture <laughs> so right, yeah. export it and put it and put it someplace safe and do nothing except print it after this <laughs> don what do you got well, Andy, to that end, what I often do too is, is I find myself in the same boat. It's easy to go too far with an edit. Uh, and so I'll typically go too far and then re-reference the original image. Yeah. And sometimes I'll even just paint in parts of the original, uh, you know, just very subtly where, you know, I just identify it to myself. I've taken it a little bit too far in that regard. Uh, I would like to see a bit of separation on the top of the painting. We see it on all of the other sides with the wall. Doesn't have to be much, just a really subtle, uh, you know, line that uh, creates some some separation there. I agree with pretty much everything else that that Andy said, but you know, I look at this, and and I see, you know, the the, the painting on the wall is, you know, the a very small portion of of, of a human figure. Uh, you've got basically the tops of their legs, their butt, the lower part of their torso, an arm on the side. But it's kind of at, at butt height, um, for lack of a better term. <laughs> and so it would be more simpatico if the photographer took an image of the person looking at it from that same height, um, just to kind of get the same type of framing. Now, I say that um, with uh, the caveat that photographing people from butt height in public's probably going <laughs> to gather some unwanted attention. Again, if you don't so, want to go to the end of the pier to talk to two strangers, don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> if this was a podcast, we would have a show title. <laughs> but hey, uh, so yeah, again, you know, that, that connection might not be possible or it might be just improper, but I would I would just make the point that making that connection would tie the, the person and the painting together a little bit more strongly. But I'll leave it at that. OK, so this is going to be like the shortest thing I've ever said on a photo. But I do have to point out Matthew Wells, much respect. Spy versus spy. That's all. <laughs> love that. So. I, I love this. It's so clean, it's so simple, and it's so powerful. And the whole concept is what you see in the picture of the loose fitting jacket with the hands in the pockets and the tighter leggings is the person that's standing and watching it with the loose fitting jacket and the tight leggings and the hands in the pocket. It is a snapshot of the person walk, watching it if for all intents and purposes. I love the fact that pretty close, the edge, the left edge of the, the painting is vertical to the left edge of the picture. Love that. Yeah. Here's where I lose a little teeny bit. I love how much space you included at the top. I don't mind the space on the right. A little more would be nice. But below their feet and to the left of the painting, I need more space. That's pretty much it. If you gave me a little teeny bit of space on the wall to the left, which you could easily do in post, 
and you added some floor below this person, to me, you've got a winning shot. Um, I just absolutely love it. One last thing. I think somebody even mentioned this, which is interesting, because I, I, I had this thought too. I don't like the shadow on the wall, right? I'm seeing that the shapes match. The painting and the person match. Anything in between them breaks that link. Hmm. So to me, I would personally go in and I would remove that shadow, but you know, obviously that's gonna be yeah. personal. I, I would I would disagree, and it's, it's a personal decision, because uh, the, uh, I think that part of the story is that this isn't just a geometric piece of art. This is something that was actually happening. This is a, a, a photo of an interaction between a person and a painting that really, really happened. I do think that that yeah. very, very, particularly because it's such a light shadow, it helps to communicate that this person is looking at a painting that's on hanging on a wall. Uh, and, and again, there's such a tight, I, I, I think that, the, that the, the editing on this is so well done because th there was the recognition that if if the original has like lots of different detail lots of ranges of of color lots of ranges of light it's not as stark it's not as beautiful and dramatic because the painting doesn't have that kind of range of of tones on it but i think that I, I, my preference would be for a little bit more information just to tell the story a little bit better if they can do it without breaking that beautiful geometric effect that they were getting uh that's going to be the challenge yeah and then there's this remember oh yeah police, gary Don thank told you told me to shoot from <laughs> from butt height. All right, next shot. And for this one, uh, Don, you get to go first. Uh, and this is Mark's shot. Uh, Mark follows online, friend of uh, a lot of well-known photographers and a good one himself. Don, what do you got? Uh, so Southside Johnny and the um, Asbury Jukes, September 4th, earlier this month. Uh, this photo was taken, as the title says. So, you know, I, uh, consider me, I guess, a little bit PTSD about large crowds uh, <laughs> after the, the pandemic and knowing when this was photographed makes me not want to be in that particular location. Um, but that being said, there is some energy with all the hands in the air and uh, including at least one person on stage. Uh, the the lighting, the framing, I think the, the overall mood and the tonality being fairly darker key, but you've got all that hair light uh, kind of giving a direction of where the light's coming from and you can kind of get that, that feel for it. I like um, the big hand in the foreground. I don't mind it. You know, if we're doing sort of um, border patrol around the frame, that one, it, it's a I'm kind of 50 50 on whether or not I, I, I would like it in there. It does kind of give a sense of depth, so I'll, I'll take it. But um, in the very foreground, you've got the shark on the back of somebody's jacket. You've also got uh, somebody's nose and uh, and some facial features that are half cut off. I take the frame up a little bit, you know, just remove those distractions because they really don't tell the story of, uh, of what we're seeing here. But I, I also question if this was exactly the the right moment um there there's just there's somebody in a white suit with uh with a very visible hat uh on stage that's just walking to the left he's not like interacting or doing anything of of significant importance and it makes me wonder i see one guy with his hands up but i don't really see a, con a connected experience on the stage itself. Like the audience seems relatively great, but the stage performance in this exact moment feels like, you know, were they just warming up? Was it them just shouting out to the audience for the, the first thing at the beginning before they started to play? Um, but it doesn't really connect to me that that they're, the audience is, that they're, it's all, like they're waving high. It's not like they're really engaged based on what I'm seeing on the stage itself. Okay, so I'm going to go through this one fairly quickly. Uh, like I say, I know Mark online, um, does some great blog posts, shares some great work. This is the legendary Stone Pony. And I shoot these type of shots all the time. And since the pandemic, I'm a house photographer for a venue. I actually tweeted something to Andy about this the other day because he had asked something related to this. When I'm in this environment now or in a photo pit surrounded by people with my mask on, I'm so excited that live music is back. <laughs> and as I'm there doing a paid job, I am also very uncomfortable at times. Like there, I, I'm very aware of how uncomfortable I am, but at the same time, I'm glad to be there. It's one of those type things. So first things first, usually if you get uh, this type of rim light from stage lighting on an audience, the band is blown out. 
The stage lights are so bright that if you get it to where you can see the rim light on the people's hands and heads, the players are gone. You completely saved the band on this shot. So I just have to say fantastic capture for that alone. I'm wondering, Mark, if you use some clarity or something on those audience landing lights, because the starburst on them seems overcooked. It seems a little over starry. Um, may not be. It may be that's the, the way these LEDs or park hands or whatever they were, you know, gave off light. But they seem a l like the starbursts are a little too obvious to me. Now, I don't know if this is possible, but a couple of things. First of all, the hand in the front, the big hand, the giant hand. Got to go. Uh, you can't crop it, though, because then you lose the Coors Light sign on the sign, and you kind of need that for stage symmetry. I personally have no problem tapping the person on the shoulder in front of me and saying, I'm sorry, can I get one shot really quick without your hand up? Or based on the look of this, you're so close to them. If you had literally leaned forward, you could have pulled that shot back, that hand back behind your lens. That has to go. The shark and the nose just crop up above. And if there's any of the shark left, just burn that down so that you, you don't see it. Um, that would help an absolute ton. Uh, let's see, Gary seems too close, so far away, okay. Um, last but not least, and this is pure, I don't know that you could have done this, but if you could have moved to the right, and again, you may be impossible, if you could have made this symmetrical, been closer to the middle, so that you could get it close to symmetry and then use lens corrections in Lightroom or whatever to really, really fine tune that, I think that you could have had, uh, a really cool straight on shot of those hands up in the air. But and I'm, I stress this every show and I'm going to do it again now. And that is photojournalism rules may apply. If you are shooting this, Mark knows this already. I, I'm just saying it for saying it. If you're shooting this for it, it all depends on it all depends on the outlet. If you are shooting this for a photojournalistic use, dodge, burn, color, correct, crop. That's it. If, however, you're shooting it for the venue, it's a marketing photo. You can do whatever you want to it. If you're shooting it for the band, it's a marketing photo. You can do it. The same photo can be used in two different ways. If your use model suggests photojournalism, stay away from removing anything or correcting lines or anything like that. And I just have to point out really quick uh, before we jump over to, um, to Andy on this one. Uh, Alistair Jolly is in the chat. Alistair is a good friend, uh, says, loving the comments and discussion on today's show. Alistair works with both Flickr and Smug Mug. He's been on Behind the Shot before with his amazing landscape photo. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be doing some critique stuff, Don and I, with Alistair and Flickr. So watch for that because it's coming up really, really <laughs> soon. And Alistair is a great photographer and people don't talk about that enough. So anyway, Andy, what do you got? Uh, there's a lot to talk. To, there's a lot to talk about here, uh, and uh, partly because partly what I want to talk about it comes to uh, God for the third or fourth time uh, in this session talking about like boy I've been in exactly that situation and I love the problem solving that happens. I've, uh, I've obviously Steve I'm not yep. like a, a professional photographer at all, so oftentimes uh, when I'm I, I, I'm like God there's such a there's such a cool scene happening right in front of me and I want to take some good pictures of it. But I don't have the right lens for it. I don't have the right seats for this i'm not in the photo pit uh and but there's always a way to take a good picture uh like and I, i've uh, uh, a few years ago like i copped to the fact that oh so the metropolitan opera doesn't care if you take pictures during the curtain calls after a performance do they because everyone's holding up their phones and they're getting probably not great pictures but no one's stopping them so that's when i started like taking i'm going to take my really nice uh, olympus micro four thirds camera and my <laughs> my 300 millimeter zoom lens and now i have a 2x teleconverter and it's so fun to try to get the get these shots but sometimes you don't have that kind of stuff with you um I see that the, they did have a, a, a pretty nice camera. They did have a, a, a 24 to 70 millimeter zoom, uh, 20 to, so, and that was uh, way, way, they, uh, way, way at the widest edge of it. So that was definitely a choice. So uh, as a viewer, my problem is that I, uh, I really had to hunt to see if there was anybody on stage at all, because this really is a picture of the crowd, uh, and that, and it can be a beautiful picture of the crowd. But if you're the story that you're trying to tell is, hey, here's the band on stage at this event. 
I, as a viewer, didn't get that. I really had to look at the caption to find out what this was all about. Uh, and this is the sort of this would have been the sort of situation where if I really wanted to get that, if I thought that getting a, a, an image of the band was important, there's oftentimes a way to sort of slide in a little bit closer. If you Wait, what was that word? Slide in like a the, like you you know you know that you're not supposed to just like go to go up the fire fire lane and just but they'll, they'll probably let you take one shot before you scurry back like the little vermin that you actually are. That's one thing that I'd be thinking of uh as annoying as it is when people are like holding up their phones to take pictures like order sheet video sometimes that's a godsend when you don't have the right lens because okay I'll, i'm going to use this i'm going to take a picture of this beautifully <laughs> bright uh, zoomed in image off of the screen and i'll there'll be the context of the entire venue around it um there's a, the other thing that i wanted to talk about is that uh there's uh, when i'm going through again that 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 camera that, that image dump uh, there is a there's a phrase that I'm going through and I'm just going through next 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 one of them is just a simple question is this anything and some and more times than not no this this image is nothing and that but that doesn't mean that it's a bad image sometimes uh, this is a good example of again as a viewer I don't know what the what the subject is I don't it's a it would be a great memento of my attending this performance but I don't think it tells the story because again I just don't see the people behind there but I would be putting this aside because this is this isn't anything as is but that gives you the opportunity and the freedom to really turn it into something as I'm looking at this I'm getting kind of excited about thinking oh, okay so the first thing I would do is I don't have an emotional connection to the stone pony. I've kind of heard about it in Bruce Springsteen's songs, but I'm not from that area. I would, again, I'm, I'm saying that using this as a starting point for a brand new thing, I would say, okay, I'm going to remove everything that makes this thing specific. I'm going to make this a generic setting of a, an outdoor concert venue. So I'm going to keep the banners, but they're going to be blank banners. There's not going to be a chorus light bottles there. I'm going to remove the stone pony, the summer stage and the logo. So it just looks like an arch over that. I'm going to uh, dropping it down to black and white. Another ace move because yes. the number of times, the number of times where, again, I arrived with the wrong equipment. I did not arrive with a $5,000, $5,000 top of the line, full sensor thing. I arrived with a phone or I arrived with a, a consumer camera and in color all i see is like sensor noise but then you drop it down to black and white and not only is it more sort of evocative but also it hides all those crimes but i'd be dropping it down to black and white and then just painting in colors wherever i want to put them uh it, it, there's so much freedom here this is such a beautiful palette a beautiful canvas that gives you 70 percent of any picture that you want to do and it's your responsibility to decide what the extra 30 percent is that's that's the sort of image that i think of when i see this again i do have to be honest in saying that this is another one where i looked at it and i said okay it is a concert venue don't know what's happening don't know who it is there's no story in here but sometimes just like the the, the number one photo when we're in that uh, that copse of trees sometimes it's a mood it's an environment i am standing here at the back of a concert venue you can make it into every concert you have ever been to or ever will be in by being creative with the editing uh, so this is this is such a great thing to have like in your library and that you just are going to entertain yourself with and and challenge yourself with over the next three or four weeks as new ideas keep coming to you yeah, and Jill says her eyes keep going to the uh, to the shark, which I agree. <laughs> yeah, but I'd probably Gary, I'd probably get rid of that. Yeah, Gary made the comment: if you can slide in, you can tap someone on the end of the pier. <laughs> <laughs> if you know so, what I mean. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, all right, uh, this may be the last image. To go. We'll see where we are time wise, but this one is called Ascension. And oh, and by the way, he said the guy in the white suit. Mark said the guy in the white suit was the keyboard player. Um, I'd like to this, see him playing, you know, yeah. his, his hands were by his side. Um, so this one is called Ascension. And I just have to say, I, I'm going to be curious what other people think about this one. Personally, I think this is super well played. It reminds me of a distant planet. And the water droplet is the security drone that's flying towards <laughs> me and about to say, who are you and what are you doing here? The, the treatment, the mostly white treatment, just absolutely works for me a lot. Uh, the lens distortion, however, your horizon is curved. I would, which is the roundness matching. That's the, not lens distortion. It's not. It's a cup. Is it just the bowl that it's in? It's it's yeah. It's yeah. in a bowl or a cup. Okay. The I'd, straight, says it's I'd straighten dish. it either way, and that's because 
with almost a mountain range in the background, I'd like to see that as a horizon line. Just take the time to straighten that. I think it would be a lot better. I don't need this oh, much. Overturned dinner plate, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Andy okay, was reading more than plate. I was. Um, I, I rarely read the descriptions. I want to judge the image without knowing it. Um, but personally, I think less, I'm going to call it sky and more water. Drop farther down below the ripples, give me less sky, would make it a stronger image. But overall, just as soon as I saw this, I thought sci-fi movie, and that's a good thing. Uh, Andy? Yeah, I, I thought Rover coming out of the sea in the prisoner to attack number six. Uh, but it's a beautiful, it really is a beautiful image, a very arresting image. It really raises so much, so many questions in your mind, and none of them about, why they why they do that to the picture? Ooh, I, ooh. It's like you really want to make the story up in your head. Um, and this is another one of those where I would I can think of things that I would try, but I'm not sure that any of them would kind of improve it. I do want to see. I wish there were a little bit more detail in whatever is, is being used as the mountains in the background. I think that would give it a little bit more context because Dave I think is in, if I, if Dave I, is in here. So Dave, let us know what those mountains are. Yeah, um, because. Um, I'm trans. I'm translating what my what my initial impressions are, and giving it technical background. Uh, I I I've, I'm thinking about if I were looking at this, what is the scale of this? If I were standing here and observing it, the fact that there is a, an object in the foreground that's tack sharp and almost no depth of field behind it tells me that this is a small object uh, in front of not a large object. And if they, if you'd figured out a way to make that background a little bit sharper, or even just f pull some tricks and add, uh, excuse me, and uh, uh, push some sliders around to make whatever little detail is there a little bit more apparent, I'm wondering how what a kind of effect that would have. Uh, I, I love the colors on this. And by colors, I mean almost total lack of colors. This is not black and white. Uh, but you can see that there, if this is this has not been forced into a strict black and white sort of thing. Uh, I, I would also wonder what you could do if you wanted to really go a little bit crazier and say, well, we're going to push the fact that this is an this is an alien, unfamiliar landscape, and so it is okay if we decide to introduce some purples into the sky. It's okay if we decide to introduce some yellows into the water below it. Uh, but once again, as we said before, this is one where you could really screw up the simplicity of it if you went way, way too far, or if you tried something ambitious but didn't stick the landing. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the only other thing I could say is that maybe I think you could crop this a little bit tighter. Um, I, uh, I think that obviously the point of focus literally is that water droplet. So you can go a little bit tighter, still keep it on the distinctly on the right side of the image. But I don't think that you'd be taking anything away from the impact of the story by uh, making it a little bit larger in the frame like that. But yeah, I, I, I like this a hell of a lot. Very, very nice image. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Uh, Don? I, I might fill the uh, the overturned portion of the plate a little bit higher with water. That'll uh, reduce the thickness of that uh, gray, uh, light gray band running through the middle of the frame. I just feel like that's a bit too dominant compared to the the mountainous structure that we're seeing in the background, and that might balance things out uh, a little bit more. Keep in mind that the the water droplet is refracting a, an image of everything in the background, and it's a wider angle than the camera that you're seeing. So whatever that is that's above the uh, I think um, it was paper towel. Uh, Dave said in the, in the chat, yeah, paper towel. Uh, it's he said it was paper towels. I love it. <laughs> so, um, but whatever is is behind that, uh, it's a, it's a wall or a pillar or maybe it's just a. a blank piece of cardboard. I have no idea, um, but it doesn't stretch far enough on the left and the right. That's why you get the little black bits in the refraction on the um, uh, on the water droplet. But maybe that's OK. Maybe like maybe that is actually such a, a contrasting element to the frame that those are there. And then you can work with that, but maybe not black. Maybe, as Andy was saying, play around with color. Maybe you can, on the sides of whatever that is, put some sheets of construction paper of different colors. Uh, maybe one uh, one green and one purple so that it really does look like some um, uh, autonomous, uh, intelligent vehicle moving around that's blinking different colors or something that you would not see within the frame itself, only within the refraction. So there's lots of elements of experimentation and playing that you can do uh, with a shot like this. And all I can say at that point is basically, keep going, 
keep experimenting mm. revel in your mistakes yeah. because you will make a lot of them and you'll ha have a lot of what if questions along the way and not all of them will have beautiful answers but the more of them you explore the more questions you will have and the more opportunities you will have to continue to experiment until you stumble across a wonderful happy accident that you will then reiterate a number of times to continue to clean it up or change it or morph it until you just kind of put the polish on the final image and this is a stepping stone towards that with certainty yeah and and i'm going to add gary made a comment in here that uh nailed it actually tom cruise's movie oblivion uh which i could <laughs> totally see this it, it kind of fits Romy made the comment that and i agree with this as well the contrast of the drop compared to the softness of the rest of the image really, really help uh, helps. And then Romy also commented, you don't need expensive stuff. This is it's paper towels yeah. as, as the mountain. So with that in mind, normally I would stop here. I have one more image. Do you guys have time to do one more? Absolutely. A lightning round. <laughs> A lightning round on one more image. Here we go. So this image is called Bowling 11 Adjust 1 because it has a ton of comments of people correcting, you know, critiquing it. And this particular person commented, they love that they're learning on Flickr from all the critiques that they're getting. And so I saw that and I'm like, I, I've got to get this one on the show. Andy, why don't you close us up? Um, all I'll say is that it's a shame they don't have, that they didn't capture any of the faces at all. The face is our user interface into the emotion of the moment when it's pictures of people. And it's a little bit frustrating uh, when you feel so I'm I'm eavesdropping on something I'm not meant to be part of, as opposed to, no, I'm part of this community. I'm, I'm, I'm the uncle or the aunt in the background uh, as the bowling party is, is happening. I'm also kind of bummed that we didn't get to see more of the bowling ball. Uh, I, I, I like the the shallow depth of field. We, we get that this is a bowling alley, certainly. So you don't necessarily have to uh, see things. Uh, it would this... Again, in storytelling, you might want to ask why is why is this girl getting advice? Is that a really tricky split that she's got? Because obviously this is her second ball, but I don't see enough detail at the end of the alley to see exactly what kind of a problem that she's trying to solve. Um, I'm also wondering if this needs to be in black and white. I'm wondering if this is would be a lot more lively and real if it were in color. Uh, again, uh, technically very, very nicely done. And and I, I will also say that don't be the aunt or the uncle that's always saying, honey, honey, uh, blah, 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 blah. okay, I want you to do what you're just doing, but honey, what's your name, Sheila? Okay, I want you to stand a little bit off to the left and turn a little bit. Well, I know you can't see her face if you're turning, but I need to get the side of your face. It's okay to take pictures that, uh, that everybody in the family will love and enjoy and you as a photographer say if i if they, if these if these nieces and nephews had only learned to follow direction this could have been a more an exceptional photo instead of just a good family snapshot i i don't even know why i show up in these things anymore but <laughs> don what do you got uh you know i I, I, I like the the shallowed up the field as Andy had mentioned, especially because the stuff in the background, like way in the back, turns into these wonderful little orbs. Yeah. Uh, and and again, you can tell it's a bowling alley. You don't need that to be uh, very concretely structured, and that inherently gives more attention to uh, the three girls here in the foreground. I like the fact that the girl on the the right, I can see her glasses at least as part of her face. But again, seeing a little bit more of that if the head was turned, and it's just if that's the moment that you capture, and it doesn't turn out to be you know more facial interaction than this well then that's what you yeah. get um the fact that her uh the the um the woman uh the, the girl on the right has her hand out i don't mind that because it shows that you know why else would there be three people here they're trying to learn or there's something that uh, that, that is happening um but the hand is an overblown white blob and if it's overblown in your in your raw file or the, the original uh, collected image, there's nothing you can do to really tone that down. And so just leave it. Uh, but if you could, if you could bring that down a little bit, um, then I, I think it would be a little bit less distracting uh, in in the overall frame. But th there's one final thing between the uh, the the center girl and the girl on the 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 uh, left, right between them. There's a really strange vertical line article artifact going up between their arms uh that's and it, the ball return 
Uh, no, no, no. The vertical line that is uh, right between, like it's, it, and it kind yeah, of I see it, but... comes oh, across yes, to to, it. to the left, the left girl's yeah. top of the shoulder with a horizontal line. Like there's this weird rectangle thing yep. that's going on there, and it makes me wonder if there was uh, a, a composite of combining multiple images together, and that's an artifact of the composite. Otherwise, it would be really hard for me to uh, to imagine how that arrived within this frame and if it is a composite then you're really free to do anything that you want within an image like this and embrace that a little bit more if you can just to play with the the light and and everything else to make this your digital artwork okay so i'm going to close this out really quick here this is a moment parents would love and to me <laughs> the story is so freaking clear even though i can't see their faces wish i could some but even though I can't, the story is super clear. Girl on the right, directing you what to do to pick something up. Girl in the middle, you can tell she's holding a bowling ball. That kind of is the argument for color because the bowling ball didn't convert to black and white in a way to me that stands out in a way that I like as much. All that said, I actually think I prefer the idea of black and white. I just think you missed your exposure. You're a full stop over, maybe a stop and a half. The hand is so blown out, you need, to, you need to expose to a point where you can recover something. And right now, if you recovered that hand, it would just go gray. So drop it a stop when you shoot something like this. And knowing you can bring stuff back, you can't recover all of those highlights. If that hand wasn't blown out and you could burn it down safely without it turning gray, make it darker than the girls were, th it would make this shot much, much stronger right away. Um, the other thing is the environment. <clears throat> I know the story, I understand the story, but the, the picture is so tight on the sides to the three girls. Open that up a little bit and open the top a little bit. So there's those that look like stars over the bowling lanes. I'd like to see the whole star and I'd like to see the end of her fingers at the bottom. So a little breathing room, I think would really, really help. Other than that, again, nice job. And hopefully that, that, you know, helped you out a little bit. Uh, guys, anything else before we finish up? Just to thank you, Steve, for continuing yeah. to do this uh, on, on a monthly basis. I'm sure that uh, everybody uh, watching this live would echo the same thanks. Uh, and if you are watching after the fact, um, make sure you check back the other episodes that Andy was on as well, because we've had a lot of fun. I think this is number three, uh, where the three of us were all on the same panel. I think and so, I've enjoyed yeah. every one of them. Yeah. 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 And, and, and once again, thank you everybody who, again, this is such a, this is such a generous act to put your uh, photos forward. I know that you, th that you think you're getting something out of this. And I hope you did, but also the fact that you're decided that it's okay to have people talk about decisions that, th that they made, talk about their own personal or emotional responses to these things. This is a laboratory. This is a classroom. This isn't uh, a gallery where snooty critics are telling well you. Well uh, said. But this, but this, but again, it doesn't happen unless people have that kind of bravery to say, you know what, it's okay. Whatever people are going to say, not only not only these three people who are talking about it, the people in the chat, the people who are going to be commenting on YouTube, even just the people who don't comment publicly, but they're going to be watching this later. So that's a very very generous act that all these people are are doing, and that's that's yeah, not and lost let, on me. And let me add that that Romy, it's his first live one, but Romy has been going back through every behind the shot show and the critique shows and leaving his own critiques on, on a lot of the images and shows. And you can do the exact same thing. You know, just go watch the back catalog, look everything up, go to the website, which is behindtheshot.tv, and you can find each and every show there, both the critiques at the, uh, uh, at the website and the regular shows. And of course, on YouTube, you can find everything too. Uh, Andy, if people want to find you again, uh, where can people go? As usual, go to Instagram or Twitter. Uh, just look for Anatko, I-H-N as in Nancy, A-T as in Tom, K-O. Uh, in the future, hopefully not too, uh, not the distant future, you can go to anatko.com to see reprints of the stuff that I'm writing for here and there. Uh, or go, and go to wgbhnews.org most Fridays, and you can listen to me talk live or later. Thank you so much, Mr. Andrew. Don, where Thanks can for people me. find you? Fun. 
Uh, doncom.ca, D-O-N-K-O-M.ca. Everything is linked to there, but if you did want a copy of my book, uh, well, you're still able to get one. Now, I will mention that if you are in the US, you, you can buy them through B&H. Uh, B&H just put in another big purchase order and I shipped that out earlier this week. Uh, although it's always nice if you get it directly from uh, the author because, uh, well, it's more money in my pocket and then that's a selfish request of mine. But, um, and that would be at skycrystals.ca. Uh, I think it was uh, somebody in the chat had asked if we're going to keep doing this, uh, Steve Cohen, uh, if after my move, we're going to continue doing this. And, and the answer is yes. We still have to worry about some of the logistics and we might change the time of the day that it's done. Uh, but uh, Mr. Steve Brazel, thank you for uh, continuing to do this, even though I'll be overseas and time zones are going to be tricky. Yeah. And, and the key thing is, it really is one of my favorite moments of the month. So to Andy and to Don. Thank you both very, very much. And I ask every guest this, and, Don, and Andy's been on twice before. This is his third time, but hopefully you will be willing to come do this again. I would love it. Thank you. And to everybody else, make sure you go to the website. It's BehindTheShot.tv. You can find all the normal episodes there. You can find uh, the critique shows there. You can find all the ways you can subscribe. And again, whatever your podcast delivery method is, please leave a star rating, leave a review, subscribe, do all of that type of stuff. As well, if you're watching on YouTube, go down, click all the buttons. Just whatever button you find, you're not gonna break anything. Whatever button you find, <laughs> go hit the damn button. And I have to say thank you again to my friends over at DVE store because I've got high def Zoom now because of them, HD video sponsored <laughs> by uh, Guy and everybody over at DVE store who do does a whole bunch of stuff with Alex and Lindsay's office hours, which I always like to give a plug to. If you've never been to Alex's office hours, you, I should say Alex's, it's the community. If you've never been to Office Hours, um, officehours.global, I think it is. Definitely go check something like that out. Uh, my name is Steve Brazel. As always, thanks for joining us. This is Behind the Shot. Make sure you join us on the next show when we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you on the next show. <laughs> I hit the wrong one. I hit the open. Let's do that again. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.